worthy you to worship you, my Father. We praise your name.
pattern out of step with following religious rules. But Lord, you are a God who, who gave himself for us. Thank you, God, that you substituted yourself for me. We thank you, God, that your blood was shed freely on the cross. As the old hymn says, on that green hill far away. Thank you, Jesus, that that was the depth of compassion that you had for me. You realized, Lord, that I could not drag myself out of my sin. And so you stepped in to this place of darkness and brought your light. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just turn to somebody next to you and tell them how amazing they are this morning. <laughs> or behind you if there's nobody next to you. I've just realized there's still a handful of people standing. Um, such power comes with it. So with, with, with great power comes great responsibility. A great man once said that. Anybody tell me who that was? Spider-Man. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was Spider-Man. It was from or it was from the Spider-Man film anyway. But um, not that I watch such secular things. <laughs> um, and just a couple of notes, we had a great time uh, at the ladies' breakfast yesterday. When I say we had a great time, I was in the kitchen and, and um, whatever, but I think, do you want to say that? We had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> we had, we had a, a great number of ladies come across and it wasn't just from the church, people were uh, happy to invite friends, which was great to see uh, people from all over. Um, Sonia brought um, a message, and we had um, Pastor Eric's wife from Wimborne, Emma. She led some worship, um, so it was just a great time. And all. Thank you for everyone who came. Thanks. I think, what was it, 37? 38. 38. Not including children. Not including, so 38 ladies, not including children, were uh, served yesterday morning. And I think last Saturday, I think we had about seven, we had about 50 something, didn't we? Not including the kids. Guys. For breakfast, guys obviously like their breakfast more than the ladies, I guess. Um, not that it's a competition, but you know, I won. And, uh, it's <laughs> but it was really, it's really, really great to be able to minister to men and women individually, and uh, that's something that we'll be doing more over uh, coming weeks. Also, just to make you all aware, I announced this last week at our AGM, uh, but over the over the next few weeks. Uh, the leadership and I will be putting a, a plan for house groups together uh, and we're going to be launching house groups at Easter which means that we won't be having our Wednesday evening Zoom Bible study anymore. The idea is that uh, we'll do a kind of two week Zoom maybe a couple of times a year where everybody comes together on Zoom and we do some special topics or something like that. Uh, but we're going to get house groups launched across the town and it is our real hope and desire that everybody in the life of the church engages with house groups so that we can all have midweek fellowship and teaching and prayer and worship together. It's really, really important that we don't kind of uh, hop from Sunday to Sunday in church life, but that we have something in the week. That's why I always encourage people to get together in the week, to meet together for coffee in ones and two, not in ones, that's a bit sad, isn't it? But in, in twos, and, twos and threes, meet together and have coffee or have 
have lunch together and various things like that. We really, really encourage that in the life of this church. And try not to do it just with people that, that you know well, but you know, get together with people you maybe don't know so well. And uh, I really encourage you to do that. Um, we had, of course, our AGM last Sunday after the service. We had a great lunch, then we had our AGM, and the minutes will be coming out very shortly for that. Have we got anything else to do? Else? That's it, let's stand together. You all know the regular stuff that goes on in the week. Coffee with friends on Tuesday, Bible study on Wednesday evening on Zoom, um, recovery Monday night, uh, toddler time on Friday, and uh, jam Friday evening, and then youth after that. It's all there. All goes out in email. It's all on the website. Let's worship Jesus together.
Because the name 
And the Passover was um, celebrated every year by the Jewish community to remember their freedom from slavery in Egypt, their freedom from captivity, which links back to what Mark was just saying about captivity and freedom in a, in a way. Um, but it's not a particularly familiar event to us, so I'm sort of going to use Christmas and Easter as, as events that are a bit more familiar to us and in a similar vein are, are very similar. Um, Christmas and Easter is not a particularly special day. It doesn't matter that it's a Sunday for Easter or a Friday for Good Friday. It doesn't matter that it's the 25th of December for Christmas. It could be a Friday, it could be a Monday. The day isn't important. It could be spring, summer, autumn. The weather's not important. The day isn't what makes it special. What makes it special is the event that we remember on that day. So for Passover, it was that the angel of death passed over the firstborn of the Jews and led to them being freed from their captivity. For Christmas, we remember the birth of Jesus, who came whilst Holy God to be a, a human being. For Easter, it's the death, the suffering of Jesus, the rebirth into life again on Easter Sunday that we remember. And it's the events that make those days holy. So holiday is a holy day. Um, which just means it's set apart, different to, to other days. And, um, and it's the event that makes it special. The day is not important. Nothing else about it is important but the day. Um, much like this bread and this wine, it's not special because it's special bread and special wine. It's juice, I'm not sure if it's grape juice or squash today, but... Um, there's nothing particularly special about it. The loaf of bread could be any loaf from any shop picked off the shelf. Um, what makes it special is the event. So like Easter, we remember Jesus' death with the bread and the wine. And the wine helps us to remember that his blood covers us and saves us. The bread could be any bread. It could be brown bread, white bread, pita bread. So it's Mark this morning, it could be a cup of tea and a donut. I'd love to do communion as a cup of tea and a donut one day. Um, but it's not, it's not the bread and juice that make it special. It's the blessing that makes them holy to us. And like that, we're not special because we're people. Don't get me wrong, people are special, everyone's unique. But, you know, if it wasn't me up here, it could be any of the other 8 billion people standing up here talking to you this morning. I'm not special because I'm a person. There's plenty of people around. We're special because Jesus died for us, and because he loves us, because he makes us part of his family. That's what makes us holy. And I guess what I wanted to say was, Christmas, Easter, if you had to work, couldn't celebrate those, if you couldn't remember them, that doesn't make them any less holy. Christmas Day is still Christmas Day, even if you cannot celebrate it. Easter is still the day that's holy because Jesus rose from the dead, whether or not you celebrate it. But if you don't stop and remember it, it's no use to you, because it's there to help you remember. This bread and this wine is holy because we prayed and we blessed it. But at the end of the day, it's a piece of bread. The bread we don't eat goes in the bin. The wine we don't drink goes down the sink. It's no less holy because we don't use it, but it's no use to anyone because it went down the sink. We need to take it in memory of what he did for it to be useful. And I sort of wanted to link you back to what we've been talking about in James because it's possibly my favorite book in the whole Bible. It, it's so practical. We're not saved because of what we do. We're saved because of the blood of Jesus, because of the sacrifice he made. It's not what we do that makes us saved, but if we don't do anything, what use are we? We may as well be holy bread that's thrown in the bin, a holy day that's not celebrated. We may as well be saved and go straight to heaven. We don't go straight to heaven for a reason. We're holy because of what Jesus did but we're useful to God because of what we do. That's how we show that we're saved. So I realise I didn't explicitly say hold on to it, but if you have held on to it, that's fine. 
The point is not when you take it. The point is that you take it to be useful. So if you still have your bread, and if you have taken it, that's fine. Let's take the bread and remember the, the suffering that Jesus went through when he died on the cross. In the same vein, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Covenant, so I'm going to say the time now. Um, so let us remember that it is his blood that saves us while we take the blood. And it's still part of communion, the third part. We remember the suffering. We remember that we're saved because of his blood. But we also go and we do things to be God's hands in this world. And that daily act of that daily act of going out and doing things is part of communion. I wanted to encourage you to, to go in the spirit of James and to be useful for God this week. Amen.
Have you been enjoying the series on James that we've been doing on Sunday mornings so far? And I'll see if I can spoil that this morning. <laughs> because we're going to go to James chapter 3. And uh, Tom was talking about the value of this book. And it really is uh, a practical, down-to-earth book. And this chapter, like all the others, doesn't pull any punches. Let's read together. James chapter 3. And we're reading just verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That's a challenging thought in itself as you begin to speak on a Sunday. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, for example, although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Sounding good so far? <laughs> All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Oh dear. James was not having a good day when he wrote these words. It's a sobering thought, isn't it, that when Jesus said these kind of things, recorded in Matthew 23, he was talking to his accusers. He was talking to the religious leaders who rejected him, to his enemies. But James isn't talking to hostile crowds, he's talking to Christians. The letter from the church, from the head of the church in Jerusalem. It's like the equivalent today of a papal encyclical, or maybe that's not the best analogy. A letter from the general superintendent of Elim. He's writing to Christians when he speaks about the tongue being set on fire by hell, evil, full of deadly poison. For me, James is a reminder, a very important reminder, that the New Testament books were written by real people, to real people, in real time. Like Paul, like James, like Matthew, like Mark, like Luke, like John. All people who wrote what they did to real people in real time. I say that because on uh, Tuesday, I think it was this week, we dropped in almost unexpectedly onto a program on BBC Two, which is a program about missionaries. I thought, oh, that's interesting, we'll watch to see what it has to say, but very quickly it clicked what the program was about. It was about young people who were giving two, lives, two years of their lives to go to different parts of the world and share their good news, their gospel, except it wasn't good news. They spoke the language that we speak, they spoke about Jesus, they spoke about prayer, they spoke about giving their lives to serve him. It all sounds a little wonderful, though. The programme wasn't particularly critical, it asks questions itself. But of course what this was about was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And these young people giving two years of their lives, a requirement if you're part of the Mormon Church, we're going to share what they thought was good news, but it's not good news. It's not good news. It's not the gospel. It's not the message of this book. It's 
It's not the message of James or John or Matthew or Mark or Luke. It's a very different story. 200 years ago when Joseph Smith, an American, felt that God had spoken to him through angels telling him that there was a new gospel, a new story written on golden plates which he would go and which he apparently claims he went to read. And from that came the Book of Mormon and then later more visions and revelations and more books came out. For him, this was a new gospel, better than the old gospel, the New Testament. Today there are 16 million people who are part of the Mormon church worldwide. Small compared to the real church, but still a lot of young people and older people taken by this. For me, when we read something like James, it's a reminder that this is a book written by a real person to real people in real time. It didn't fall out of heaven or get written by God on golden plates. It was written by men. Men with two feet firmly on the ground, writing to the real situation in their day. Men whose words can be trusted because they were there. They lived with Jesus, they walked with Jesus, they knew him, they were commissioned by him, they were inspired by him. So that the words they write are not just their words to their people, they're also God's words to their people. Because God spoke through them. James had listened to the words of Jesus for 33 years of his life. Well, not quite 33, he was younger than Jesus. But he was his brother, lived with him, grew up with him spoke with him, listened to him. James had come the hard way. Pastor Gareth spoke about this last week. He'd never believed in his older brother. May not be quite like Paul who was persecuting the church before the blinding light of revelation made him aware that it was Jesus he was persecuting, not the people who served him. But James had come the hard way along with his other brothers and sisters. They never believed in Jesus. Maybe they were just too close. Maybe they couldn't believe that he really was the Messiah, the Son of God. And they'd grown up with him, they knew him, and they didn't believe him. As Pastor Gareth said last week, he was a cynic. He was prepared to listen to Jesus, but he didn't believe that he was who he claimed to be. But that all changed when Jesus died on the cross that we have been reminding ourselves of this morning, and then rose again on that third day and was now ascended into heaven from where he sent his Holy Spirit to fill his people and to start the church that he had came to establish. James had come that hard way, but now he believed. And in time he went on to become not just one of the apostles, one of the leaders of the church, but the leader of the most important church of its day, the church in Jerusalem. Very important words that he speaks in this letter of James. It's Abraham Lincoln that said actions speak louder than words, or as another commentator, Mark Twain, put it, actions speak louder than words, but not nearly so often. <laughs> James had no time for people who claimed to be Christians, but didn't show it by the way they live. Which is why he says, if a man, he says, faith, but has no deeds, he's not telling the truth. He's not really a Christian. If you claim to have faith, but there's no change in the way you live, then what you're claiming isn't real. It's not that James didn't believe in faith. If you go back to chapter 2, he makes it clear that Abraham believed God and was counted righteous because of his faith in God. But he went on to say that Abraham's faith was proved by, completed by his actions. He was willing even to sacrifice his own son if God wanted him to do that. <coughs> Except God didn't want him to do that. There would only be one son who would be sacrificed. And that was God's own son who laid down his life for you and for me and saves us because of that. But what James could see as he looked out on the church for him was heartbreaking. He was writing from the church in Jerusalem, but he was writing to Christians all over that 
vicinity, all over the land of Israel, the land of Israel. Many of those first Christians that he was writing to, of course, were themselves Jews. And yet to James, they were no better than the Pharisees that Jesus had railed against. There in Matthew 23, when he called them whitewashed tombs. Men who would cross land and sea to win, win a single convert and then make him twice the son of hell that they are. James is looking out and seeing almost the same thing happening. That vision Jesus had of a community of love, of godliness, of faithfulness, of truthfulness, was crashing head on into the reality of human nature. And they were not living the life that God had called them to lead. And for James, as he wrote his letter and about the evil that was there in the church, it wasn't just the case that they weren't feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting those in sick who were sick or in prison, as Jesus had spoken. But it was also people who had an issue with their tongue. What does he say about it? A seemingly insignificant part of the body, the rudder that steers the ship. The gift of language, of speech, of course, is an amazing human faculty, isn't it? It means that you can share what's in your mind with me through that gift of language, through the gift of your tongue. We can share our hopes our dreams, we can share our passions and our desires, we can share our human emotions with each other, joy, pain, compassion, regret, longings, resentment, love and hate, all through this one little organ in your body called the tongue. Words that may fall on listening ears, words that may fall on deaf ears. We may speak in haste, but repent at leisure. Especially, of course, these days, if you turn those words not just from your tongue, but into words in texts, or emails, or even WhatsApps, if you've been watching the news. We can speak with a smooth tongue, or we can speak with a forked tongue. David says this in the Psalms, he says, people who sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their word like deadly arrows. David knew what it was to encounter the power of the tongue. Solomon in Proverbs says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Such a small organ in our bodies and yet with such incredible power. James paints a sad picture of the church in his day, there was hypocrisy. People were praising God on a Sunday, and yet they were cursing men on a Monday. There were words of betrayal, words full of deadly poison, words of evil set on fire, he says, by hell itself. The tragedy is, I know, and probably you know, of people who are not in church today because they've encountered words they've been affected by a tongue used in that way. No wonder James says no one can tame the tongue. Well, no man can tame the tongue, but God can. God can change even the power of the tongue. And if we are to allow God to help us to turn faith into action, faith into deeds, then we must allow him to also change the words we speak. Imagine yourself in a situation where you're called to be a witness to a crime that you've seen happening and you're there in the courtroom and you stand in the witness box and you take the oath. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And the words that come out of your mouth in that courtroom will make the difference between whether that person who's accused is judged for their, their crime or gets away with their crime. The lawyer that's speaking against the accused will try to trip you up, will try to 
deceive you, will try to make your words sound unreal, untrue. The person uh, speaking for uh, the one who's the one who suffered from the problem will try to allow your words to bring the truth, and then the jury will make their decision, weigh up whether the words you've said are truth. How true is your testimony to Jesus? That's the question that James is asking for us this morning. How true is it? It's an amazing thing, isn't it? When you and I stand not in a human court, we stand in the court of heaven. And as we stand there before God, we don't have to say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because as David says, before a word is on my lips, you know it altogether. God knows what's in your mind, in your heart. For me, speaking truth is like a kind of foundation. It is a foundation to our lives, whether we are a man, whether we be a woman of our word. That what you say is true, that what you say is who you are, that you are speaking with honesty, with integrity, you are a person with a good reputation. True sure is that if you know somebody is truthful, if you know somebody is honest, if you know they are people of integrity, then you'll trust them. You'll even trust them with the most intimate secrets of your life because you know that what they say is true, that they are truthful people. Foundations are essential, of course, for any building. Most of the time, the foundations are not seen. They're hidden underground, but you soon know if they're not there. But what James is saying is foundations are not enough. It's what you build on the foundation that really matters. I love that moment in the life of Jesus where he's spoken about himself as the bread of life. We've been thinking this morning about the bread being his body, the blood being the, the cup being his blood shared for us. And Jesus had said of himself, I'm the bread of life. And then people said, well, give us this bread. We want to live forever. And Jesus went on to speak about the bread and the, uh, the, the wine. He said, the bread I give you is my flesh and the wine I give you is my blood. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not part of me. And people think this is a hard teaching. Of course, he was sharing spiritual reality, not physical reality. John 6 tells us that after people had listened to that, though they'd followed him for some time, many of those who thought of themselves as his disciples stopped following him. And they went away. And Jesus turned to the twelve who were still with him and he said to them, are you going to go away as well? And it's Peter who answered so clearly. He said, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. He was speaking life. He was speaking truth. You have the words of eternal life. <coughs> That's why we're here this morning. We're here to celebrate his words of truth. To sing about his words of truth. To listen to his words <coughs> of truth. Proverbs 15 says this. The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. The question for you and for me this morning is, does my tongue bring healing? Does my tongue bring life to those that I speak to? Or does it bring pain? Does it bring anger? Does it bring cursing? Does it bring death? Even truth can hurt if it becomes a weapon to wound and destroy. We see that, don't we, all around us in our society today. Proverbs 25 says this, words fitly spoken, a word fitly spoken, is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Just a word, a word fitly spoken. How beautiful are your words this morning? That's the message that James is asking. Does your tongue bring healing? 
We all know what it's like, don't we, if you're in a room and then somebody with great personality, great charisma walks into the room. Somehow all the attention is drawn by that person. It feels electric as they have walked into the room. They've changed the atmosphere of the room. But what James is saying is this. When you walk into a room, when you start to speak, do your words lighten the darkness of that room? Do they lift people? When you spend time talking to somebody, do they go away feeling lighter, feeling taller? Do they go away with a smile on their face? Or do they go away head down, depressed, with a heavy heart? Jesus said of those that betrayed him, these people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, God doesn't just read our lips. He can go behind that and read our hearts. He can read our minds. David in Psalm 139 realized that as he prayed that wonderful prayer in Psalm 139. He said, Lord, where can I go to escape your presence if I go across the sea? Even there you are. If I go the farthest journey I can take, you are there. Where can I go to get away from your presence? I can't hide from you. See, you can't fool God. You can't hide the truth from him. What does James say? My brothers, this should not be. It doesn't have to be like that. No greater evidence of our faith than the fact that our faith changes the words we say, changes how we use the tongue that God has given us. Now one of the most amazing truths is this, that on the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, when the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples who were there on that day, the very first thing that God did was to give them new tongues. Now I know, of course, that was also especially about the gift of tongues. But isn't it powerful that when God's spirit fell, the first thing to change was the tongue. God wants to change our tongues. He wants us to speak words of life, not words of death. He doesn't want us to be guilty of the things that James is speaking about here, the things that he saw as he looked across the church, the things that he saw as he sat down to write these letters, this letter to these people in his day, in his time. Words, words of life, words of love, words of power, words of healing. I guess any of us could say this morning, well, who am I to speak words that are going to change the world, change what is happening in our society around us? I'm not the prime minister, I'm not a president, I'm not the head of a great business empire, I'm not a film star, a sports star, I'm not a musician, I'm not a great orator, I'm not on radio or TV. How can I make a difference? Actually, you can make a lot of difference just by the use of your tongue. The words that we speak, a word fitly spoken, is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. The tongue that brings healing is like a tree of life. It's an amazing thought that as we walk out of this building, even before we leave this building, with our tongues, we can speak life into each other. We can give a word of encouragement, a word of blessing. We can change the course of somebody's life just by the word we speak with our tongue. As we go out into a new week and we meet people on the streets, we meet people at work, we meet people in our community, our tongues can transform lives simply by speaking words of life <coughs> over them. How we greet people what we say to them, a word fitly spoken, the tongue that can bring healing. David puts it another way in Psalm 45, he says, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. What can be said of your tongue? 
this morning, of my turn this morning. James writes these words to the people of his day, horrified at what he saw, realizing the power of an evil tongue. But he says it doesn't have to be like that. God can change your words. He can change your tongue. He can enable you to speak life rather than death. Thank you, James, for these words, written as they were in the heat of battle, facing Christians whose tongues betrayed them. Your words are challenging words, God-breathed words, not words that were written on cold and plates, words written by a real man to real people in real time but words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit, words that are God-breathed words, words of truth, words of life, words that God calls us to speak today. May God enable us to do that for the glory of his name. The worship team come back to lead us. Let's just bow in prayer, shall we? Thank God for the gift of language, the gift of our tongues to serve him, to speak, for him. Father, thank you this morning for these words of James. Thank you that you inspired him to write these words, challenging words, the words that offer the hope of a change, the hope of life. Filled with your spirit, they would be people of faith who prove their faith by the way they live, but also by the way they speak. Lord, help us to be people who use our tongues to bring life to bring healing. Lord, help us to be people who speak your love, your truth, and your life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> Stand together as we close our service. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. Let's sing together.
die in our spirits. Lord, I just thank you for your presence here this morning. Lord, we've just so enjoyed just worshipping you, Lord, and, and hearing your word. And Lord, may we be challenged by what we've heard this morning. Lord, may we go and, and think about it, Lord, and, and uh, meditate on it this week, Lord. I pray, Lord, I just pray that you will take us safely as we leave here this morning, Lord.